thank you so much for joining me. Let me say me today. I'm your presenter for chapter eight conditions. Um, and again, I'm going to start with disclaimers. Number one, this book is hard. Number two, um, I am not a guru in whatever I'm going to teach. I've also learned this stuff myself. Um, it has been enjoyable for the parts that have understood and very stressful for the parts that have not understood. Um, number three, there, there are gaps in my presentations in presentation and apologies in advance. I have not tackled the exercises because I spent so much time trying to understand the tiny bits um, here and there. Uh, do I have another disclaimer? No. Oh, not a disclaimer, just, just to highlight that. There's something we covered in week four when we were presenting with Alan and I've used it at work and it has helped me a lot. And I'm like, oh my God, I love this book club. That was just a by the way. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, now which one do I share? Okay, uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can project it on the browser. Just give me a minute. A minute. Close, close, close. Uh, project. Then I still don't understand how to do try catch an hour. I read this chapter twice. I can tell you I that. I still don't know how to do it. <laughs> I can tell you that. I do it wrong every time. <laughs> I can tell you that that's maybe one of the things that I think I've understood, but other things are like, uh, share screen, uh, Google Chrome. <gasps> I almost left the meeting. <laughs> share. Um, you should be seeing my screen right now. You can, cool. Um, I've also, hmm. I've closed Hadley's book and I wanted to refer to it in some uh, level. Let me see if I can open it up again. Chapter eight conditions. Cool. So, ah, move. Okay, so welcome. Why did I choose to present, um, to make this presentation or to be the one training let me say training um, today, presenting. One time I saw try catch on one of my former bosses code. Then she was so good in coding. Um, and when I saw try catch, I asked, what is it for? And she was like, it's just for capturing errors. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know this. And my first thought was like, I fear. I'm like, will I ever get to learn these things? And that's what I do. Um, in life, I choose to teach or present something that I don't know about so that one, it can force me to read. <laughs> and two, just to, I'm also, I recently got a job where it requires me to write functions and I have to use try catch and all these conditions to uh, handle um, some of the errors and warnings. So it was, um, that was why I was really motivated to work on this. So we are going, this was the initial outline I had in mind, um, introduction, signaling, blah, blah, blah. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to look at the quizzes. I had time to look at them, but I was like, ah, this is another struggle. I just, we struggle when we are together. Um, and then um, we have some gaps and I'll explain why as we go, it's because there are things I really, really didn't um, understand. Um, cool. Again, I've not even got better in terms of making my Zaringan present slides. I just copied what we had with Alan before. So I'm sorry if my work looks like untidy, um, I'll get better with time. So um, a condition system, it provides a paired set of tools that allows the order of the function to actually indicate that something unusual is happening and the person who is using the function to deal with it. Um, and for us who've used R a lot, we know how, how like when we get errors and R has evolved. I feel as though the errors we were getting some time ago have kind of improved because sometimes we'll get errors like, okay, so what, what am I supposed to do with life, uh, with this error in life? But then also um, some of these errors 
um, you know, once you get an error over and over again, even though it's in Chinese or it's in another language, once you start to sort it out, you get to kind of know it. But then what happens to this new person who comes and sees something like NAS introduced by coercion, you know? Like for me, at first I was like, okay, what is coercion in the first place? Um, but then every time I see that, it always hits me, oh, something is wrong, something's wrong. So this whole chapter was... Um, helps you to know how to deal with errors and actually it kind of helps you learn uh, how to be better at writing um, error messages yourself you know like telling someone you know what you're getting this error because of one two three which is what we need in life like like debugging errors already is just like a problematic thing so we need to write uh, better errors so we are, we look at um, three conditions. Um, the first is stop, uh, warning, and messages. Those are, those are the things we are going to try. Um, so those are like signaling conditions. And then we'll have handling conditions, functions that handle conditions. Um, that is try cut and with calling handlers. Um, we know about errors, warning messages. Errors, they, they indicate that you cannot continue. You cannot, the function cannot continue at its current state state warnings kind of indicate that something has happened in the background but don't worry like the code has been able to pass through all that then we have messages that give you more information about certain functions um, or certain i don't know once you write a certain function uh, a certain code in r for example if you're loading a library uh, for example if you're loading tidyverse it will tell you oh we've also loaded this 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 and that um, which is very important to know such things um so this is just how you will um uh, write errors warnings and messages in in um, in r so <laughs> let me tell you before this i even never knew there was a function like stop i think i knew about warning and message, but I never really knew about um, stop. So that's how you will write an error. I'm hoping you can still see my screen and um, the warning and the message. And these messages, as much as they're in blue, because our Zaringa replies have been set to appear in blue. If you try this on your R console, they will actually appear in red. Something else is that for the warning, it can actually appear as warning or warning message. So I don't know when it will appear as warning, like warning, then colon, and then sometimes it will appear like warning message. I don't know when each of them appears. Um, uh, ha, huh, errors. So again, um, errors in this R errors are signaled by the stop function. Um, and in the code for someone who will try this later with the ring gun, and I stole this from Hadley's um, the advanced R GitHub. Ideally, if you run these codes, especially the or error codes on a normal chunk, your Zaring and slides will not render. So you have to put an option called the on top of on the R chunk, like error is equal to true. I never knew that option exists, but anyway, that's where we are able to have the error codes that like actually execute on these. Um, that was just a by the way. So Every time, um, so in the book he's written that when you signal an error, it will tell you error in my function, then give you the error message. But he's like, where do we even need to know? The, he's calling it the call, you know, the code you, you write, the code you'd have written for it to produce the error. Like you, we really don't need that. So you can always put an option call dot is equal to false. Um, that does away with the call function. So if you look at the error, it, it kind of, it's displayed in two parts. There's the call, which in the first section, in the first piece of code, you can see uh, my my underscore function one. Um, um, that that will be the call part, and then the other part is the message. So in this R, um, things are like errors are displayed in like two parts: the call and the message. Later on, he speaks about how we should make these errors uh better like adding metadata like we don't really want to know about the call and the message like tell me more and uh, we'll cover that um in custom conditions anyway also add lang um i don't think oh i've used add lang once there's a time i was trying to use the kali kali bracket but i don't really i've not found myself using a lang um ever like at work or in my analysis but anyway he says um a boat is also a better 
um, function for conditioning um, errors. Yeah, I think errors, warnings, and all, all the signal conditions um, to better function. And he speaks about how it helps us in the later chapters, not the later chapters, the later sections in the chapter, which I think is a section I didn't even understand, but we'll get there. Um, but you you will use the function about in Alang to signal an error. Okay. Um, you cannot have multiple error signals in one function. So what um, I was trying this just for fun. Um, we have the first error, the second one where we don't want the call to be displayed. And then the third one is um, an error for the Alang one. So it only um, displays the first one because of, I think something called exiting handlers, which um, like when an error is signaled, things at that point stop and nothing happens after that. That's how I understood it. Um, okay, then we have warnings, um, which indicate that something has gone wrong, but the, kind, the function has kind of recovered, which to me, I always put, reco always put recovered as a question mark and I'll explain why in the next slide. Um, and unlike errors, you can also have multiple warnings from a single call function. Um, which is what I've um, shown there. Then by default, warnings are cached and printed only when controls returns to the top level. I have to admit, I don't really get the whole idea of top level when it comes to code. Sorry, maybe I'm not such a deep programmer, but I don't really what, understand what we mean by top level. Uh, maybe someone can explain to me that. Yeah? I think it's when you're returning from the inside the function environment, and then you go back into whatever environment you're in. So for example, you're working your workspace. So cache until the top level, top level is I think wherever you've called the function from. So if you're like working normally, you've got all of the stuff, warnings accumulate, and then once you leave the function, you're now back on the top level environment, and then all of the warnings get printed, I think. I, I, I love how you explain it like, Sorry, I'm also not a big fan, like the whole environment thing. I, I don't really think I really understood much, but I'll get there anyway. But thank you so much for the clarification. Um, I'll read more about that because there's a lot of top level usage over here. Um, yeah, so what else did I want to mention here? So, okay, that's it. And then this is a part I really, okay, I understood where like by default, uh like the warnings are displayed um i think at the end i think you get the output first and then the warning so you can set options such that um you want to make them appear um immediately and also turning warnings into errors i love the idea of turning warnings into errors again i'll explain why but <clears throat> where do you set these options because i don't know i tried Sorry, I tried setting these options inside the warning function and they didn't work. Do you set them the way we set, I don't know if you people have used Skype N when you want to kind of reduce the scientific, um, the number, oh, the decimal places or convert a scientific number to like a normal decimal number. So do you set it in a chunk or do you say, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows um but maybe someone can can mention it um at the end of this anyway now um again arlang has its version of signaling warnings which is um using the function one um uh, yeah this is also a warning i wanted to mention this i don't know whether we i ever mentioned it in the previous chapters but like now I know that there are very many ways. When packages are being built, and maybe this is my subjective opinion, when packages are being built, um, developers try to make things that can be done in base R easier for us. Am I wrong to say that? Like it's like there's always a there's always a way you can do it in base R but they kind of make life easy because I'm thinking like when you look at the tidyverse or let's say a function like 
filter from the player. Like if we were to filter data from this R, which is something I think I've ever done once and I didn't like it. So filter kind of wraps that function in like a better way. I don't know. Anyway, just by the way, why do I insist that warnings should be errors? Oh my God, let me tell you. I have a history with this warning. NAS introduced by coercion. Like this has messed up my analysis big time. You know the way they're like, it's just a warning, you know, let's move on. It's not an error. Ha. I even made a pull request. I really hope they do. There's a part where I really hope it's merged rather. There's a part where Hadley says that there are warnings that he feels that should be errors. And I was there, I'm like, if, can we add this example? Because I think it's a big thing. And I've given an example here. Most of the time I deal with survey data um, and you will get data where, like when you look at it with your naked eye, let's say it's age or income or whatever. When you look at it with your naked eye, you can actually see, ah, this is like, let's say numerical or whatever. Um, it, it looks like numbers. But then as a good analyst, you'll be like, let me confirm. So when you confirm, it actually tells you its character. I'm like, ah, this is age. It should be a numeric variable. So what do you do? As dot numeric. But then if there is a value in that data, that variable, that is weird. And by here, I mean weird, meaning like 50 plus. I'm dealing with data that has a lot of 50 plus ages. Or even a value that has a white space in the middle it's converted to NA and you will as dot numeric and your code will not give you an error. You know, like, ha, ah, let's move on with life. But then some values have actually been converted to NA and you'll do your analysis. And there's a part where you, where you go to creating tables for ggplot, you're going to say mean into brackets, um, age comma NA dot RM is equal to true. And you will forward your results <laughs> Later, that's when someone will be like, ha, huh, okay, no, imagine your results have already gone to like the client in a very beautiful deck and they're like, there's something wrong. I thought blah, 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 just because, just because you ignored that error. Trust me, this is something that has really burnt me in analysis. And every time I see warning and is introduced by coercion, I'm like, hold up. I really have to know what's going on. And I actually teach this because it's, it's something that students really, you know, it's part of data cleaning, but then sometimes you just get tired. You're like, ah, especially if you have, I've loved this whole conversation going on on Twitter about Excel and all, but if you have like a very um, big data, like data with many rows, you know, sometimes, or maybe you're doing your analysis quickly. Those are some of the things that you can miss out, especially a white space. Like, anyway, I'm very passionate about this warning stroke error. So if you do the options warn, I just tested it. Um, you do it exactly as you use options sci-pen. If you just enter it in the console, when you do the as numeric, it will give you an error. What will it so do? Here. Yeah, so if you look, I just posted it in the chat. Um, so you know how when you are used to setting the options side pen to give you more numbers so you can actually see usually yeah. for me it's my p values. Um, if you do options warn equals two, just straight into the console. Next time you try to do as numeric my vec, it will throw an error rather than a warning. But what, what's the error message? Uh, same thing. So same thing, but it will stop your code at least. Oh yeah. So it was like within a function, you could at least rather than like do 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 do. Now I'm gonna make a graph like. <laughs> okay, but for me, I'm um, I'm thinking like a beginner. You know, um, how will a beginner tell themselves that? Oh my God, I need to set all my warnings to errors first of all. Again, and it's something maybe we are going to talk about the error message. And is introduced by coercion. First of all, what is coercion? Like. Sorry, I didn't have time to Google, but what is coercion? It's from, if you remember chapter two when we were talking about type, type conversion. Mm -hmm. um, so coercion is just, it's trying to find a type that will fit basically. And since it's, it's not smart enough to understand the plus, it's like, oh. that's just gobbledygook to me. 
So now I've converted it into, I don't know how to deal with this. Oh, wow. That's very nice. Okay. I never thought about that. Okay. Cool. Thanks. But anyway, yeah. So I feel um, we should really stop ignoring warning because this is just an, an example I have. But then I've also been thinking about which other warning is this tricky. He's given examples in the book that I've never used and I, I, I didn't even understand. So this was one I was passionate about. Anyway, if my pull request is merged, I will have I will have made it in life. Um, moving on. Um, oh, so. What are we dealing with here? Oh, so I gave um, these examples. Um, some warnings should be errors more than warnings. I've explained that. Um, then we have messages. Oh, I didn't change this. Okay, so messages, they just, they're just a way of informing your user, just giving your user um, more information about something. But then he also says that um, make sure your message just gives enough information but doesn't really overwhelm um, the user. And it goes back to something I, I was discussing with someone about, and I also saw the discussion on Twitter. So you know how you load library, some packages, and then they tell you a whole story, like, thank you for installing my package. Oh my God, I'm so excited, blah, 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 blah. Please make sure you, that's what I did with my package because I felt I am not charging people to use my data, but I will really want to see my name in an article or a paper somewhere. So once you load it, that's the first thing they tell you. Hi, thank you so much for installing this package. If you want to reach me, please reach me, <laughs> reach me through my Gmail. And if you want to search my... Anyway, so it's not displayed here, so I don't know what's happening, but someone was telling me that that can be, especially when it comes to CRAN rules. I've not dealt with CRAN. But someone tell me it can be a bit tricky. But before I push it to cram, people will have already got the gist about it. Uh, but yeah, the good thing is that we have functions that can suppress the message. So like suppress message, if you don't want to see any message. I've never, have I ever had the need to, to oh yeah, is that time I was pulling data from the, some database and it kept telling us some message. I can't remember. And it was so annoying, so we just suppressed it. But I feel as though um, ignoring such conditions is um, always tricky. I don't really use suppress message that much. Um, also, he talks about comparison between cut and message where you use cut when, um, like you use cut when the primary, the sole, the primary role of the function is to display something like when you want to, I don't know, when you're writing a function and you want to display um, a message or something, but then message is when um, you as the developer chooses to relay some information to the user. So these are, although I think there's just a small difference, but anyway, he talks about that difference. You can read about it more um, in the book. And I give an example. Um, so as so I think the user is the one who will use cut a lot you know, when they want to print something on the console. But a message is something that is displayed even when the user chooses not to, I don't know, display it. There's just a definition in, in the book. Um, yeah, so yay, we get to the interesting part. Or is it? <laughs> Signal, signaling conditions. Um, the simplest way of handling conditions is ignoring them, which I think is tricky, but um, you can ignore errors using try. So in the first example, uh, did you know Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya? I thought you should know. So um, my function is displaying two things. It's meant to display, it's, it's meant to take into numbers and add them, but it's also supposed to display uh, the statement Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. So I've added um, my argument, my function takes in two arguments, but when I call it, I'm only using one argument, like da, argument where is missing with no default. I think this is one of the best errors. Like it's, it's very intuitive. You can actually know what it's um, talking about. But what you notice is because of the error in the first line, x plus y, my next line, which is Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya, will not be run because at that point, um, the code stops, which is again, exit handling, whatever. Uh, so when you use try, so try will, if as much as there's an error, life will still continue after that. So it, that error will be captured, but you'll still get the, 
the next output that that is cut um Nairobi, like Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya uh yeah so try is just a way of like enabling the function to still run even though there is an error which is something I'm currently using right now I'm trying I'm fetching data from a certain database for different countries and not all countries are like not all not all countries data exist in that database and we are using a loop so we have this message that says oh uh, the data is not available blah 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 so try has come in very handy um unlike errors messages and warnings do not terminate so I, I hope you get what we mean by terminate if we didn't have like in the first function we don't in the first function we don't have uh, a try function so the second line is not ran but um unlike errors messages and warnings don't terminate so even though you if, a, if you have a function with different warnings or messages like if you have an error you'll still get the message somehow so as we mentioned you can ignore errors using suppressed warnings and message not errors warnings using suppressed warnings and messages using suppressed messages like in the last example <sighs> ah oh sorry for the typo <laughs> i thought i had corrected it so it doesn't run the message because anyway we've suppressed it but we'll still get the output six power two is equal to 36. now huh handling conditions every error has its default behavior so here is the whole top level thing error stop execution and return to the top level i think for me the most important part over there was they stop execution so once once the error is caught nothing else happens um warnings are captured and displayed in aggregate i mean i think by aggregate they mean at the end like they're all all the warnings are listed down at the end is that the meaning of aggregate i would think so like together yeah all together basically yeah, yeah okay thanks and then messages are displayed um immediately so condition handlers allow us to temporarily override or supplement the default behavior so like i think there's a way uh, this R behaves when it comes to errors on in the messages and we can always set our own options or change some things uh, to fit as well. So I think a question I had for you guys is which part is the handler? Like what is the handler exactly? Let's go back to the try example over here. Is it the try function that is the handler or is it my whole function 6b that is the handler? Because I think that's a place I'm still confused. Like what exactly is the handler? Because if you look at um, these statements, try catch and with calling handlers allow us to register handler, which are functions that take the signaled condition as their signal, as the single argument oh my god is it this i think it's this wait is it oh i've not even reached there i think i've okay sorry we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back we'll get to that i think i think okay i'll ask you once we get to that slide and then um we can discuss anyway so try catch uh defines existing handlers and here again existing i think it's because of the fact that once you get an error nothing else happens after that um which makes it work with errors and interrupts. And then with calling handlers, um, they work with non error um, conditions. So condition objects, I think I had mentioned this, like sometimes when you get an error, the error comes in two parts, there's the call and the, and the message. But how can you actually extract um, each of them? So you can use call to condition call to extract the call and use condition message to extract the message the first time i saw cnd <laughs> let me tell you a story the first time i was reading this chapter i saw cnd and i was like gosh what is cnd can i use x can i use y you know the way different whatever functions can take in any argument so today i was looking back at it and there's a line where he says 
blah, 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 which I have called CND. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been looking for this statement forever. But anyway, so you can use Arlang to extract the parts of this um, error. And I think this is very important when it comes to custom conditions, like when you're creating your own conditions. Again, which is a place I never understood, but anyway. Um, then we have exiting handlers, try catch, yay. So try catch, um, again, existing handlers because they cause code to exit once the condition has been caught. Try catch has two parts. The first part is your code, your normal code, x plus y, x minus y, print this, print that. But then it also has the error part, which is actually a function that tells your code what to display if it gets an error. So try catch has two parts. The first is your code, which hopefully if there is no error should run perfectly. But then the other part of the function try catch is the error function, like what should be displayed if the code gets an error. Now, I've just given an, a, 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 a small example. If you, have to, if you have a function that takes in two numbers and wants to add these two numbers, ideally these two numbers should be numeric, right? Show me this not numeric, so da, you'll get an error, no numeric argument to binary operator. But then, what if you want maybe a better error or you want, um, how do I put it? You want, I don't know which example to give. Um, you're doing a series of things, but you want where if it catches, or let's say you're, you're, you're inserting your function in a loop that has different X's and different Y's. So every time it gets an X and a Y that is numeric, boom, magic happens. When it gets one that is a character, um, you want it to display the error, but it, should, it shouldn't stop, something like that. So what do you do? Try catch has two parts. The first part that is your normal function, not normal function, normal operation. So my normal operation here is take the two numbers and add them. The second part is, okay, what if we get an error? Madam, what do you want us to do? So the second one, the error is a function of the condition. And inside, that's where you should put the message that you want displayed. Okay, so before I was very confused. Do I wrap my function inside try catch or am I wrapping try catch, in try catch inside my function? So in my head, my mental model is, since I learned what a mental model is, I, I think I use it every time. I feel very, very geeky when I use the words mental model. Anyway, so here my thought is, write your function as it was, right? This was how my function is. We are very good at writing functions. This is how my function is. But then when you want to use try catch, pick your code that is X plus Y and insert it in a basket called try catch. And in that basket, there's something else, which is the error function. I think when you try to think of it that way, it stops being confusing because initially for me it was. So what happens again when we insert shell it will be like, ah, there's an error. But then you'd already said, okay, if you catch the error, your base R error is very boring. Please use mine. Okay, mine is not interesting at this point, but anyway, you get the, you get the point. Please use mine. Um, so what will happen is, I don't know if I put it as, oh, I never put it as an example. If you insert a better value, let's say three, you will have two plus three is equal to five. And I think for me, that was the best part of learning this chapter. Even though I don't understand other things, um, I'm really happy that I understood. I think I understood that part. So again, your error, I think either I've mentioned or I'll mention it later, your error should be good enough that your error message should be very intuitive that people do not have to struggle. Do you see how when you're using filter, for those of us who use the tidyverse, if you miss one equal sign, you know, you, we say filter, blah, 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 is equal to, is equal to twice. If you miss one, the error you get is 
did you intend to use the double which to me is heavenly i'm like yes how did you know thank you like we know like already the error is stressing you you know um you don't want the error message to also stress you because sometimes some error messages like okay well, what am i supposed to do with this and so i just copy the whole error um to google and hopefully get something um but yeah so your error should be intuitive in a way that it actually helps the user know what is wrong and i really feel as though especially the tide diva system they've really improved the errors like nowadays the errors are very intuitive like show me please stop stop combing your hair i'm like oh sorry i'm combing my hair that's what is causing the error but anyway yeah um then so, with so question on using try catch properly so what if i want for example now my phone to actually return something specific sorry, error please, speak, error. So, please speak closer to you i don't know if it's the mic because i'm feeling uh, you am i am i louder now is that clear? Okay. Yeah. Um, so how do we get try catch to actually return something when it's inside the function? So I just tried as an example, um, this, I'm going to just kind of paste a little bit of code. I just tried into the chat. I just so I tried. I don't, I don't think I can see the chat. So I don't know how that will do. Somehow oh, okay. when you're going to see the chat. Um, let me try and minimize. I think you, um, if you hover like um, your mouse at the top of your shared screen, you can come up I've with the window. It. Yeah, you got it. Thank <laughs> you. So, function of x try catch, print that this, error. Error function. Catch. So the the idea for me is I'm always wanting to like write functions that when they error will return a specific value to me. Um, and I've never been like how how to do it in I thought in Python try catch Python try catch oh. try accept is very easy. How to do it properly in R? I have no idea. And I've never been able to figure it out. Like like the error giving ah he's covered that somewhere. Is it one of those sections that I that I skipped maybe? Um, there's a place I don't know whether it's in applications. Um, it is in applications. Let me see. Um, it was I think it was a fast application. Where he says, let me see, failure value. Like you want it to return a certain value. Is it something like that? Like return a near where, I don't know, return a, a, a certain value. Like I've seen your example of 42. Return a certain value if an error, um, if, if, if the code gets an error or something. So he says we can use value so that um, this was a function again. Oh my God, I'm not lazy. I was just trying to use the simplest functions to understand this chapter. So we have a function that takes two numbers and multiplies them. So if I had two numeric, I would have two times three. But then if you insert one as a um, character, you will get an error. But you want, instead of getting an error, you want it to return a certain value. So I should have actually used an example of another value. I think in the book he uses an A. So it gives an A, but so mine displays this statement. So does that work? It should. Let me, let me think how, how we add this value. Um, you just make your... You, so your function, your <laughs> let's say top level function, I don't want to use wrong words, but your function should have your argument plus one more argument, which is the quote unquote return value if there is an error. And so your error function should return that value that you specified in the function. Um, so here, for example, if, if I had fail underscore width, two comma, 3,42 as your example, I bet I will have 42 instead of this um, character string. Section 8.6.1, there is even, he's given more examples that I really didn't understand. So uh, I think once you go through that, it can be more understandable, I think. 
actually i've just i've just learned that recently so okay um cool so where were we also oh, with calling handlers again remember when you have uh, an error um a signal whatever what are they calling them <sighs> forgotten where like you can only have an exit handler you can only have one uh, piece of code but with messages and warnings you can display plenty there's something here i want to ask so this is a handler that registers a message like once it gets a message it should display another message so my message here is oh my god i now get why this book is titled advanced r because i now get it but then i want it to signal since it has already caught that message i want it to tell me to give me another message i would have used another message a better one like hey i've noticed a message up there or whatever but then if you look at the output it first gives me the the the, the handler message if i would call it that way and then it later gives me the initial message does that make sense i wish we knew what exactly the handler part is but if them if, if this is the handler if i'm using the right words the message uh, this package contains a message please read it carefully blah 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 this condition should only be displayed if there is a message in my function so i don't know why it's been displayed before but there's a place where he says in the book i'll read because i had noted noted it down Handlers are applied in order. So you don't need to worry getting caught in an infinite loop. In the following example, the message signaled by the handler doesn't also get caught. I don't know what that means. It's, this was section what? 8 point something. Let me see. 8 point, ha, it was 8 point what? Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. It should be 8 point four something. 8.4 condition exiting uh calling sorry this is the oh this one over here so there's something handlers are applied in order so you don't need to worry blah 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 so the first the message is second message but this is the one that like is the handler or is the message to be returned if the function displays a message but this is the original message so 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 it first signals then it gives me the output is that how it's supposed to be i don't know me i'm confused <laughs> but it's good confusion uh maybe something to think about but beware if you have multiple handlers and some handler signal conditions that could be captured by another handler, you will need to think through the order carefully. I'm like, hardly come again. What does that mean? Sorry, ah, this chapter was really tough. Uh, but please allow me to continue. Then maybe we can ask ah, we can ask questions later. Um, okay. So okay. Um, the same thing with uh warning it first displays the warning on the handler and then gives me the original warning i feel as though maybe there's a line in this book that explains this maybe it's what we've dealt with anyway i don't know ha then he talks about something called muffle my god i don't know what that was i don't know what it means so hello blank screen i'm sorry i really didn't understand that um did someone go through that part muffling muffles the default handler handler which prints the message hey, hey. life life is hard i also sorry now now my problems have started i also didn't understand call stacks i really didn't understand call stacks i also didn't and uh, oh definitely i sorry I, I mentioned this earlier i didn't tackle the exercises not because all of them were hard i think also because of time um yeah sorry uh custom conditions 
so in, ah in my slides i jumped mafol and also call stack i'm sorry um and exercises custom conditions um he says that which i think makes sense one of the challenges of handling errors in r is most of them are like most functions generate one of the built-in conditions which only contains a message and a call i think i'd mentioned that um and so the idea behind coming up with custom conditions is adding more info um to the error and even speaking as a user sometimes i really appreciate errors that are really detailed like i don't want to struggle um so he says the abort function in Erlang makes work um, easier as it provides a window to add metadata. He talks about uh, motivation. He gives another example, but I'm back to my <laughs> example of um, NAs. Okay. If I was to take a numeric, uh, if, I was, if I was to convert everything to numeric, it will tell me NAS introduced by coercion. But what does that mean? You know, as I'll just say it as expert R users, but I'll say as, as an R user who has used R for a longer time, I, I understand what NAS introduced by coercion mean, um, at least now even with better explanation. But thinking about a new B, you know, like even before they Google this, can you please tell them what could be the problem? Um, NAS introduced by coercion can be, I don't know, can be a diff bit difficult to understand. So the whole idea here is to add your own piece of like error message or warning, which overrides the default. Um, so in here we have the handler the, with calling handler, and then you're changing them to numeric. But then remember, by the way, I forgot to mention Remember, try catch has two parts. It has the code, your, your piece of code, and it has the error code, the error function. So the same thing with, with calling handlers, you have your code and the um, warning function. But then you can put a conditional warning function such that, for example, in my case, if any of the values is a character, display that message, get? And here, my naive assumption is that the only time this warning and is introduced by coercion would be displayed is when you have a character vector. So this is just a naive example I've used in my head. Um, he's given an example of when, like when you're taking log, when you're taking the log of uh, certain values, um, it gives you a certain error warning warning or error, I don't know, I think it's just error, but then it doesn't actually tell you which of the arguments are actually causing the error, something close to that. But yeah, that's the motivation. So signaling, like how do you, how do you tell someone what the error is, I think in better terms or in an easier way. That's how I understood section 8.5.2. And if anyone else understood it differently, I would be happy to hear that, which is just the same as um, the example I've just given before. So instead of um, non-numeric argument added to binary operator, I think that's a bit straightforward, but you can make your error better. Yeah, so for me, I wrote one of the arguments that you have provided is a character. But then again, you have to, as, as a developer, you have to understand all the possible errors that people will get. There's a place where Hartley says, um, at, at times it can be difficult to think, to understand the me mental model of a user when they're using your function. You know, when you're writing your functions and you want to package them, there's a way you're thinking, but your user could be thinking in a different way. And it's, it's um, sometimes it's difficult to think how they will think so that you can write better error messages. And that's why I think the tidyverse has evolved because maybe they used to write the errors in some way and then people people complained and they were like, you people, so you just write better errors. So just tell me, oh my God, let me tell you something. Sorry, diversion, one minute. There's a time ggplot. I, I don't really, I don't know, the main developers of ggplot. Someone asked, uh, we usually, on Twitter, uh, every time you run this code, you get this error. 
but this error is not intuitive. How else would you want us to display this error? And I was there graciously. I'm like, please tell me that the reason I'm causing this error is because of one, two, three. I can't remember that example, but I gave my input. I'm like, so, like so just tell us what the error is. Tell us we've missed a bracket. I think the, the I think it was a bracket. Tell us we've missed a comma. Tell us, you know, like just be simple, use simple English. And my idea was taken. It's funny that I forgot it, but my a lot of people, I think a lot of people get their input and then that developer put all the inputs in one and he came up with something that I had suggested and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, anyway, that was just a by the way. But at times when we are developing packages or functions, we need to think about the end users of our work. Um, yeah, so I tried different examples here. So he says, um, the good thing with using a boat as opposed to stop is that when you're creating your custom conditions, you can actually use glue to glue arguments and statements and whatever together to form a sentence. So let's say, for example, in my case here, I want us to add two plus a certain number plus another number. So I want, ideally, your X and Y should be numeric. Two plus three plus five, that's 10. Is it 10? Yeah, it's 10. But then um, the error you will get here is the same as what we have before. Two plus blah, blah, non-numeric argument binary operator. So can we try and give the user a better error? So in the first function, the user provides a numeric value and one character va va value. So it tells them three is a character. Okay, she'll have used two values three and four, three and seven, whatever. But you see what happens here is that we are gluing, putting together the argument that is character. So if it's, whether it's X or whether it's Y, we are gluing the character value to this statement. But then there's also a possibility where you have two. Both of them are characters. So you want to tell the user what they are doing wrong. So you have to write a function that captures all the possible errors that can occur. I know this is, these are not the best examples, but I hope they kind of make sense. I didn't understand 8.5.3 somehow. Uh, I don't know why. I didn't cover the exercises. We've already talked about this, which I thought was a, a really good. Um, Any time when you get an, like when you get an error, instead of just displaying a message, maybe you can insert a certain value. Um, again, you have to put the value as part of your, what? As part of your function. Something that I learned was, and it, I was asking myself this question, how are package developers able to write functions that have default arguments? You know, where you're told by default, um, this should be this, so that if you don't insert it, then it's, I think it's still okay. I think this, I learned that from this function. Anyway, I've not tried that, it's just an assumption. But yeah, failure value. Um, when you just don't want to display a message, you want that value to be replaced by uh, something else. And then used the same success and I don't know, this was this was a bit off. Oh, like I thought I, I thought I understood it. I don't I don't know if I did. Um uh -huh. oh so here we want no, I don't think I think this is just a first example. I think I just forced this so that I could be happy that that things were working. I, I don't know. Success and failure values. Ugh. I also didn't understand that and that and that. I didn't cover the exercises. Then I finished. I'm sorry. I'm just being honest. Um, if anyone went through the applications, I think there was a lot of jargon words used. Um, maybe I'll be coming back to that. But anyone who, who wants to discuss something I didn't cover, but they understood it better. I think this is your chance. 
I hope you've learned something. I really do. So, so has anybody gone through the exercises um, and wants to like walk through them a little bit or has one they thought was interesting? I unfortunately did not have time this week either, but I kind of wish I had. Let's see. I think or does anyone you... know how to make the fail I... with return work properly? <laughs> I also think had Lisette's had questions. I, I would imagine sitting in his class, a whole exam. Oh my God, I think I will fail. Uh, but maybe he would have taught me very well. I don't know. Um, so and I, I have to say, just to kind of empathize, I found it really hard as well when I was like towards the end of this chapter. So I wasn't, I thought it was like, maybe I just wasn't getting it at all. But it's good to know that it's, this maybe is like a bit of a harder thing to wrap your head around. Because if we're all we are sh there. We've shared that problem together. And yeah. <laughs> I also kind of struggled with this, uh, especially um, from 8.4 handling conditions on. I was mm. a bit lost and didn't really know what to do. I am yeah. human. Yeah. I am human. Anyway, I, I wanted to try out what um, um, uh, Ann Lee was trying to. Let me see if I can go back to my R. Stop share, stop share, stop share. Then share screen. Um, where is R, where is R? Code three, code three, share. That's my R. Uh, then go to uh, chat, chat, then copy this. Oh, I copy control C, then come here, minimize that. Can you see my art studio screen? Yep. Oh my God, what have I copied? I thought I've copied something. Chat Control C. Okay, let me just try to click. You might just write it out because uh, I tried to copy something from the chat. Oh, like uh -huh. I don't know what's wrong. Oh my God, it's not working. <laughs> Do you ever go to these presentations where like your deck is ready, you're ready to present to the client or to your supervisor and then things just happen and they've never happened before. Anyway, oh my God, now do I have to type all this? Okay, fine. Uh, test, test underscore function. Sorry, I don't type fast. I'm not able to type fast. It's equal to function of X, okay. Open your brackets. Now, try, catch, mm -hmm. print log of X. Oh, okay. Bye. Print. Wait, wait, wait. Don't log off everyone before we get. We're going to make it work. We are a lot of prints here. A lot of genius people. Function of 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 y, then then cut hello there, hello, then return ah uh -uh. oh what a makeup oh we tried the let me show you what I was talking about um control f find Find, 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 don't have find. Um, mm, 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 failure value, fail we. So copy this, control C, R, ah, am I opening another script now? Control V. Fail with value. So let's say fail with uh, a million. So what are we doing? Take da, 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 da. Take this one. 
run. So yeah. Um, is Anne still with us? I, I don't know which part was, I don't know which part was bringing problems. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is what I thought of. So because there will be an error here, it actually returns the value you insert. So here I've tried to insert, which will be a million. Is that clear? Is it clearer? So when you're doing this kind of stuff in R then with try catch, I mean, it's clear-ish. It's just very different from the way other languages do this error handling. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear me. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm putting like groceries. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess this is just very different than the way I'm used to seeing it. So if, if you've done like the way Python does their try accept is very different than this. And I think it's just, it was getting my head around that this is working in a different way because it's returning objects that it is confusing. But do you mind, do you mind kind of explaining how Python does it. Is it easy to explain verbally? Like how, yeah. how? Yeah, it's super easy. So in Python, you would just write the word try and then you'd write a little chunk of code and then you would go back out one line and write accept and then another little chunk of code. It's, which, it's very, which very chunk simple. Of <laughs> so it, which it, chunk it's, just, it's just like how you write uh, if else. Oh, so which part is the error? The else that's, part, the yeah, last part? Like an but there's also try in yeah the L R part would be the error part but i think it's the same thing sorry and sorry yeah sorry. i i think it's the same thing as because that's another thing i was really like i was thinking about like interchanging these two like try catch try and do something and if you get an error please throw something back at me isn't that the same way as how you explain try something accept something because i'm thinking accept something the something after accept is what should be returned if an error is thrown try this piece of code accept. yeah if there's an it error does, give does it try do that is, i think um, it, i think um, it's, it's what the difference now between sorry i sh and please go ahead i'm not quite sure what try does but i think try is basically um if you have try and you have an error in there, then it's still executing. So it continues the execution. Um, and I was I was also wondering, so a more general question, when would you really use try catch? Is it just like when you try to um, debug something or you really use it in a function when you, when you write the functions or? I don't think I will speak to that because I'm not a user of this. I'm only starting out. So I don't really, I don't really know. But um, to go back to that discussion about Python versus R, I think maybe, yeah, um, it makes sense in the way it's written in Python. But maybe in R, they, they, they bucket. Like, what if the condition is true? Uh, is met? What if the condition is not met? They wrap that in the try catch function. So try catch has two parts. If everything works fine, good, run this. If everything doesn't work fine, run that. I think that's, that's it. I think actually a question um, now to go back to the question that was asked is, when will you use try catch? Because you can use try to ignore stuff, right? Like when you have pieces of code and then you'll get errors and like, okay, fine, um, I know this error. But think about it, what yeah. if, Sorry. I think I I'll think about it in this way. Maybe try. You can use try when you know what error you're expecting and you don't care. You get. I'm fetching data from a database. I know not all countries have data in that database, so it's likely to throw me an error telling me not found. Fine. Like okay, I expected that, but can we still move on? We can use try at that point. But then try catches when you the error is not foreseen by the way maybe the error is not foreseen anyway I'm, I mean, I'm trying sorry I, I think how i understand it is um for try is the same way that you explained it but for try cache is more of like if i want to do something with the error 
regardless okay. of okay. when I know it, the exact error that, that I expect, or because there could be different errors. But if yeah. I want to do those with error, that's, that's what I, I think. Uh, okay. But what would you want to do with the error? Give me an example. Sorry, I'm not trying to put you in a fix, but um... it's so so it's so hard to come up with a, an exact example. But uh, for example, if if you know if if you're writing um, a very robust code, then um, I think you could um, think about like five different er common errors mm -hmm. that that you can that you want to solve. You know, so if if it is kind of error, I'm and I'm thinking in terms of like the Python try try mm -hmm. thing. So if it is if it is this kind of error, then you want to do something. If it is this kind of error, then you want to do something. And if it is other kind of errors, the rest of them you do something else. Oh, do you then it's... define beforehand with this like in this case the C and D, uh, which kind of error it is that you expect, and then which kind of value you would um, return? Yeah, I, I, would, I would think so. I would think so. I think my question here is really, what's the difference between try Maybe you've answered, but allow me to still ask. What's the difference between using try catch and just using an if-l statement? <laughs> <laughs> like, I've been thinking that a lot because in my current code, some project I'm working on, I have if R statements, if L statements rather, like if, oh, wait. I know you have to actually understand where the error, because what I've done in my code at work is I know where the error is being caused, is being thrown. So I've dealt with whatever is throwing the error. Yeah. yeah. So if else this data has zero roles, do not run this code. Ah, okay. See, so that's, that's, that's pretty. That's that's pretty. That's pretty fine. But uh, the good thing with this kind of um, I don't know, um, set up when you're dealing with the error itself, you can run conditions on, on the error, it's, um, in, in a sense. But if you're really using the, the if else itself, then you really, you need to do something extra to, to, to run, uh, to test for, for, for that error. Yeah, okay, anyway, we're just starting out. Um, I hope things will be clearer. Um, I think Hadley should book, I think we should book a time with Hadley for him to just explain this whole chapter, but maybe there are worse chapters than this. Um, but I'm so grateful that you decided to listen to me and you've stuck to the end. Um, I'll post whatever I have, um, I'll push it to GitHub, but maybe an encouragement. We, we shall try looking at the things we've not covered today. Um, if someone else, by the way, I think someone should even book time, you know, um, if you feel, especially the application part, anything after 8.4 was really difficult. So. If someone feels... Do we want to, just out of curiosity, um, so next week we have like a, re a re recap book, is that right? Yeah. Do we want to I... do a recap of like the exercises for this section maybe? Like focus on I don't it? Want to lead. <laughs> I don't want to be the one leading and maybe someone who understands this better than I do. Um, I'll be happy to be a student in that class. Um, yeah. I'm not so sure. I'm just playing catch up right now. <laughs> um, but I'll be ready to read, to read, to read through the assignments at least. I I know maybe some exercises we could have. Oh, I'm gonna stop recording. I can speak real quick. Okay.